It's the most exotic and revered predator on Earth. The tiger needs no introduction, but soon it may need an epitaph. A deadly trade is close to wiping out the species. It's a race against time. But conservationist Anthony Marr is convinced that the Bengal tiger still has a chance before the world waves goodbye to the last wild tigers. The dawn sun creeps through the mist at Bandargarh National Park. This is India's forest heartland, timeless and untouched. For centuries, this exquisite setting was the hunting preserve of the Maharaja of Rewa. Now it's a safe haven for India's rich wildlife. But this is the animal that Anthony Marr has come to see. It just gets right into the core of my soul. There is no adjective that is adequate to describe its beauty, its magnificence. It's, it's just the most beautiful animal on earth that I have ever seen. When I see a tiger in the, in the forest, it's a magical feeling. Merely knowing that it exists without even seeing it is a, is a, is a magical feeling. And, uh, and I know that if the tiger is gone from this land, this land will have lost its soul. It was seven million years ago that the tigers of the world originated in what is now Manchuria in the northeast of China. This was the dominant predator that feared no other animal a solitary beast, chiefly nocturnal, that kept to itself, a little like our domestic cats, and just as likely to keep the neighbors cursing their feline turf wars. Anthony Marr is no stranger to Bandafgar National Park, it's one of the success stories in tiger conservation in India, and he's come back here to find out for himself how the tiger population is faring in a very hostile world. But seeing tigers here is no foregone conclusion. They've over 400 square miles of wooded territory to hide in. Of course, on the roads they leave their telltale tracks, the pug marks that tell you who passed by and when. No one blames you for looking over your shoulder. Do you know how fast it is? In the morning. In the morning? About 7 o'clock. About 7 o'clock, so it's about 5 hours from now. Yes. Can you identify this tiger? Yes. Mm -hmm. The name of this tiger is Bada Bacha. Big baby. Bada Bacha. Bada Bacha. It is a cub of Sita. A cub of Sita? Oh, cub I see. Sita. I see. It is a very heavy tiger. This is Charger, Brabricha's dad, and no lightweight himself, the most famous of the Bandafgar tigers, who got his name scaring the wits out of tourists by charging at their elephants. Charger's mate Sita has produced 18 cubs over the last 11 years, yet just seven made it to adulthood, a high mortality rate that concerns Anthony Marr when he considers the future for the species. In all, Bandargarh is home to perhaps 40 tigers, but no one knows for sure. 
marking their territories like a cat with urine and tree scratching, male tigers will patrol up to 50 square miles of forest, giving other males a wide berth. The females are interested in a territory only for prey and to protect her cubs, often within or straddling a male's domain. However, his main concern is a territory that holds a large harem of females for breeding. It's not possible to think of India without thinking of tigers. At the turn of the century, there were upwards of 100,000 tigers across the whole of India. The British Raj and their Indian cohorts to turn into a national blood sport. Grandiose killing parties gave visiting kings and courtiers the bloody chance to bag a skin for the living room floor. It was all good fun. Trophy hunting was the first scourge of the tiger. One Maharaja talked up about 3,000 plus tigers all killed by himself. And that is amazing because if you count all the tigers in India today, there is not 3,000. When the British left, tiger numbers still stood at 30,000. But 20 years later, in the late 60s, a national census recorded a knife-edge national population of only 1,800 animals. In a state of alarm, Indian conservationists convinced the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that the tiger was in real danger of extinction. She responded by placing a total ban on trophy hunting, forcing state governments to afford tigers protection, and in 1972, she set up Project Tiger with a clear aim of turning the tide. Mrs. Gandhi's Project Tiger got underway and central to the plan was the creation of new tiger reserves. Now the tiny tiger population could settle down in peace and with some security, get on with what the world expected of them. Tiger nature being what it is, we were not to be disappointed. Project Tiger was an undoubted success. Within 10 years, the population almost doubled and the world breathed a sigh of relief. Yet the dice are still loaded against these little kittens. Tigers are born blind and helpless in a well-hidden den, and their eyes don't open until their second week of life. The mother's alone with no mate to help her. And when she has to leave the den to hunt, the cubs are at the mercy of every passing jackal, wild dog, or python. Even another tiger might make a quick snack out of them. So it's good going for a wild tigress to raise more than one cub to maturity every year. And yet for those that do survive to adulthood, the hope for continued survival and success for the species will ultimately depend on a well-stocked forest larder. Tigers can make ten or more attempts before being rewarded with a kill. Patience and tenacity are their virtues that ensure them a full stomach.
villagers were evicted from their homes and resettled without compensation in new farming areas just outside the park. Here they continue to scratch a living from the soil, often with an understandable deep-seated resentment of the tigers and the conservation movement. And that can translate into a perilous situation. Outside Bandafgar, this old man tells stories of tigers coming out of the park, killing his livestock and not getting the proper compensation. He's not surprised that villagers have been leaving poisoned meat. Too many people, too many cows, too little land, and a magnificent animal, the tiger, not welcome and in trouble. Gar, it's summer and it's siesta time. When you look at tigers, you can't help comparing their behavior with your domestic cat. As long as they're well fed, they'll snooze contentedly all day long. The afternoon temperatures can be well over 110 in the shade, and sometimes that's just too much even for a tiger to take. At the edge of the park, it's wash and brush up time for the other residents. In the noonday sun, elephants join the mad dogs and Englishmen. It's one of the perks of the job, a midday massage to ease the old bones before you get another giddy round of carting eager tourists round on your back. Assessing the health of tiger populations is not easy. In years gone by, the authorities overestimated tiger numbers to make their conservation efforts look more successful than they really were. The biggest stumbling block to tiger numbers is lack of good habitat. Tigers need space and they don't like to share. When the family splits up, the heat is on for each of the cubs out on their own to establish a new territory. That's tough in a land where the forest is shrinking daily. And that is only the start of the tiger's problems. Ever present is the threat of death at the hands of poachers. The poachers themselves are mostly Indian village people. They were given about $50 a bottle of whiskey. They'll do it for anything. Based on police seizures of the dead animals, the official death toll is almost certainly underestimated. But probably for the whole country, somewhere around 700 animals every year end up as part of this grim and sinister trade. These poachers have made hundreds of thousands of dollars with slaughtering and selling tigers. An often corrupt justice system and tiny fines only makes things worse, much worse. In the biggest ever haul of poachers contraband, the Delhi police inspect this fortune in tiger skins and sackloads of bones bound for China. So the 1990s was a, was a desperate de decade for the tiger, and that is due to poaching, to supply the oriental communities around the world with tiger bones medicine, tiger penis medicine. The Chinese believe that the more powerful and the more spirited an animal is, then the better medicine it's going to make, because the Chinese believe that if you ingest the body part of a powerful animal, then the power can be transferred into your body. It is all due to the Chinese consumption of tiger parts that these magnificent beasts are going down. I end up very embarrassed and sometimes extremely disgusted. So at, at one point I said to one of my friends, I said, uh, somebody's got to do it, somebody has got to stop this, Chinese 
tradition, and uh, I believe it has to be a Chinese person. The Chinese do revere the tiger. In fact, they are revering it to death. Of the 12 animals on the Chinese zodiac, it is the dragon first and the tiger second. But of course, the dragon is mythical. The tiger is real. But the tiger is going to become mythical pretty soon. Basically, Chinese culture is trying to wipe out the tiger, which took 10 million years to evolve. And who are we human beings with an evolutionary history of less than half a million years to step in and within 50, 60 years wipe out something that, that took so long for, nature, for Mother Nature to achieve? Across the Himalayan mountains in China, demand for traditional medicines ensures that each dead tiger smuggled here is worth a hundred thousand dollars. There's a newfound affluence in China, and that means that without considerable help, the world's 4,000 remaining tigers don't stand much of a chance. Within China, they're just gonna keep on consuming because they just wanted an extra dose of uh, fortification for their failing health or whatever. They don't know how dire the situation is. Maybe they don't care. What is worse? Ignorance or apathy. That's the problem that the entire world has to deal with. Fortunately, neither ignorance nor apathy are acceptable to Anthony Marr, and rallying willing troops to the cause is a full-time occupation. The distinguishing feature of this event from any other tiger conservation project anywhere in the world is that this is focused upon kids. We believe that uh, the only thing that hasn't been done so far to save the tiger is to involve children. And I feel that if we can raise the passion of the children for the tiger around the world, I believe that there is a very good chance that the tiger can be saved. The Western world loves a good cause. When you're well-fed, well-housed and reasonably clothed, it's easy to take the pledge and solve your conscience with some spare change. But the real battleground lies somewhere else, a world away from the bright lights of North America. 1,000 million Indian people, excruciatingly poor and increasingly desperate, are the ones who ultimately will decide the tiger's fate. And they have a lot on their minds. Perhaps Anthony Marr has got it right. The idealism and uncluttered outlook of kids is fertile territory. Any kid who wants to save the tiger, raise their hand. That's great. There is no other persuasive force more powerful than children's voices. In time, so the theory goes, powerful voices will change the world. But meanwhile, the 40 tigers of Bandafgar don't have the luxury of time to spare. What these animals desperately need is a completely safe haven. National parks have often been targeted by poaching gangs looking for easy tiger pickings. Security is still the number one priority for the conservationists. The most important is to enlist the help of the people who actually live in Tigerland. Because they, first of all, are the poachers, they are the woodcutters, they are the cattle grazers. And to this end, Anthony Marr and international aid programs are showing that there could be a local payoff from tiger conservation. There is money for medical clinics and doctors, and there are some encouraging signs that the Indian villagers are responding. Slowly, the rural population is coming to understand that tigers are worth more alive than dead. Once they came to hunt the tiger to death. Now both Indians and foreigners come to see the living. With ecotourism, there is a growing awareness that might just pay the ultimate dividend. A secure and growing wild population. The 1970s was the era of Save the Whales, when a global rallying call galvanized the world into action. Now it's high noon for the Tigers. The world of the 90s needs a repeat performance. And one thing is for certain, 
If we can't save this animal while there's still time, future generations will look back and shake their heads in disbelief. <laughs>